Ringo, do you feel international yet? Ooh, I feel international. This is Global Connections. That's Russell Hunger. He comes around once in a while, tells us about international meetings and, and trade agreements, and mostly APEC, actually, because he is a master plan author uh, for APEC, the APEC master plan. And it's always an honor to have you here, Russell. Thanks for coming down. Well, thank you, Bill. I mean, uh, uh, Jay, uh, for the, uh, inviting me again. It's been a while, but I've been kind of focused on the uh, APEC conference gonna in uh, San Diego, Chile. I hope uh, next week, matter of fact, it's going to start from the 7th of November to the 11th, where all the leaders going to get together. And I did prepare a strategic business plan. Uh, then I did pass that on to the APEC leaders, mm. especially to the, uh, uh, the ministers and mm. the senior officials there. So they can look at our white paper, our position paper from United States, Hawaii. Are we going to strategize and do business with the APEC uh, community? And as you know, this year, uh, Chile is hosting the uh, APEC conference. So uh, and we have a good relationship with Chile. Uh, we had a sister state relationship with them as well, some of the cities. And Hawaii does. Yes, we do. With, uh, I think the different counties have different uh, sister state relationship. As I recall, oh. Chile's having some commotion in the street lately. That might affect things. Because if you have, um, you know, free-floating protest, uh, and then you have APEC in the same city, in Santiago, uh, the protesters might find APEC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, that will not necessarily be positive. <clears throat> so you mentioned that this conference, uh, the one coming up November 11, was uh, all about four issues. Let me see if I can remember. Um, it was about um, the economy. Yeah, uh, I can mention it. Uh, it's it's going to be basically in the digital, the digital e economy. economy yeah. And uh, one that's going to make sure that all that the internet uh, is going to be free and secure, and, and how to do the business in terms of uh, if you're going to have to pay taxes or not from foreign country to not, if they have a free trade agreement or mm. not. So those things are going to be a minister on the digital uh, uh, 4.0, they call it. Uh, and another one is uh, SME, small business enterprise. As you know, we, in the United States, we have a small business administration that looks and takes care of the small businesses. So like you go into like other third world countries in Asia, a lot of them are small and medium uh, SM, enterprise. SME, yeah, yeah SME. so they work with the lar large mm. enterprise and large corporations. Mm. And uh, the third focus might be on the uh, women in empowerment. And basically what they do is uh, creating, try to enhance uh, women in uh, entrepreneurship. So as you know, worldwide, we want to see more women playing a major role in leadership role. So those things are going to be added. All these things are being discussed elsewhere. Yeah. So. Another important is the climate change. As you know, there's that uh, mm -hmm. inclusive growth in terms of sustainability. As you know, we had a uh, Paris Agreement and it came out with the 17 SD, uh, strategic uh, development goals. And uh, based on the, what they use, the 17 SDGs is uh, based on uh, evaluation for performance measures. Because uh, the Paris Agreement says by year 2045, they should be fossil free. But uh, by year 2050, all the third world countries should be fossil free and not using uh, gasoline consumption. Well, that brings me to question. Who's in the 21? What, what, you know, I remember that there are 21 nations who are part of APEC. The U.S. is one part, and I guess Chile is another part. Uh, and they rotate around among the nations. You get one every... You get the meeting every 21 years, yeah? And ours is what, three years ago, four years ago? Yeah, we actually hosted in 2011 when 2011, uh, President well, Barack Obama was the flies. president at the time being. Yeah, so uh, a yeah. good thing he brought it to Hawaii, and that kind of helped me out, you know, and I proposed a master plan after that to mm -hmm. the APEC organization for uh, integrating uh, all the 21 countries, meeting the Bogart Doctrine, which says that by year 2020, uh, we should have a free trade area in the Asia Pacific region. So uh, that's Who's the, we? the all the twenty one countries, the APEC, and that's where we started with uh, uh, having. We're involved with the TPP, the Trans Pacific Partnership. China was pushing for their RCEP, mm. our Regional Comprehensive mm. Economic we're Partnership. We're out of that now. Yes, but uh, eventually in the future, I know that they. Uh, so this Chile uh, uh, APEC conference is going to be very important because what happened is Chile took the but leadership. Tell me who's in the 21. Uh, basically, I can name all the countries, but uh, uh, we have uh, as well United States, Canada, uh, uh, Peru, uh, Chile, Mexico, 
and uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan. Uh, we have China. We have uh, uh, Indonesia. We have uh, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, going down to Brunei and going down to uh, uh, Thailand. We don't have Cambodia, Laos involved yet, and or Sri Lanka, but even India is not a member. But mm. in, in, maybe in the future, we'd like to have India be part of the mm. APEC uh, yeah. country as well. So, uh, but you know, no without, European countries right now. Uh, no European country. They could be setting aside. But I did propose on my uh, strategic business plan that uh, uh, I pass it on to European Union because what European Union is looking into coming into Asia. And uh, if you look at the history, uh, by post-1920, all the Europeans are here, British, the Germans, uh, the Norwegians <laughs> as well, and they colonized a lot of the South Asia countries. So now, because of the post-World War II and all that, and aftermath, uh, they kind of pulled out. Now they're showing the effort that the Europeans want to be going to Asia so with the trade and commerce. we'll talk about that later in the show, yeah. So I did propose that in my uh, strategic plan. Maybe we can unify the European Union integration with the APEC organization, because that kind of puts all the 21 countries, the uh, European Union, and 21 countries, APEC uh, organization, they, uh, oh, they yeah. can, they can interesting, integrate, interesting. and this could be part of the uh, Euro-Asia. It's about uh, the same number of countries. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, maybe the policy unit committee of the APEC organization could look at that and uh, hopefully uh, yeah. see if that might be a good way of uh, integrating uh, That's not the included, Europeans and though, the Asians in, in together. the four uh, issues you mentioned. I guess there's an agenda out, and those four issues are on the agenda, but those, are, those issues are discussed worldwide these days. There's nothing really fancy about them, and there's nothing, there's nothing in those four issues. Did I get this right? There's nothing in those four issues. Uh, digital economy, a small, uh, medium uh, entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. enterprises, mm -hmm. uh, sub uh, sustainability and climate change, and mm -hmm. women in entrepreneurship. Yeah, there's an integration. There's nothing of, there about uh, you know expanding global trade. Right, Is right. That just so I think there's a, what? there's a you know in trade and facilitation uh, community. You know, because you got to look at the uh, physical distribution of goods and services. Mm -hmm. That includes marine time with ocean highways, uh, airports with airlines, you know, moving uh, cargo as well. So they got to look at the trade and facilitation of the physical distribution. So those, uh, in terms of transportation, those uh, intermodal concept is very important. Integrating those three uh, transportation modes from ocean, air, and mm -hmm. highways. So and who, who goes? It isn't, it isn't necessarily the heads of state. I would be surprised to find that Trump went, for example. Is he planning to go, do you know? I believe uh, Trump going to be there, because yeah. uh, Chile is our, our one of our number one ally in mm. South America. Mm. And uh, we have even have a, a visa waiver program, so they have 90 days. We don't have to have a visa with uh, Chile. Oh, he hasn't, he hasn't put them uh, aside yet. Yeah, most like I know that he didn't go to the Papua New Guinea one last year, and he mm -hmm. let uh, Mike Pence be there, and our Secretary of State was there that as was well. That was last so, year. Yeah. But I think this year with... Uh, the election, you know, coming up next year, I think it might be a good gesture to him to go there yeah. and show that, uh, you know, we are. So especially if he goes, other heads of state will go too. Yeah, I think. believe me, yeah, it's a it's a, it's a heavy head uh, uh, conference with Asia Pacific leaders there. So. so what what do you expect will come out of it? I mean, these four areas and possibly, you know, more expanded trade trade provisions, trade agreements. The U.S. is an inter trade agreement, so that. That's definitely, um, you know, an obstacle mm -hmm. because uh, we don't we don't do trade agreements, so we certainly we don't do multilateral trade agreements mm -hmm. these days. Mm -hmm. We bowed out of TPP mm -hmm. and other mm -hmm. things. Um, we don't want to do uh, COP twenty twenty four or twenty five, whatever's coming up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, w w what kind of agreements do you think will come out of this, and and will the U.S. be an active player in those agreements? I think what's going to happen, we're already uh, strengthening our bilateral trade agreement. That was one of the things I recommended to uh, our president when he came in office that uh, when I was working on the TPP, asked him to stay on with the TPP. But I guess uh, the administration wanted to strengthen the bilateral trade agreement country to country <coughs> before that we get into a multilateral or trilateral agreement with different countries. So in this case, uh, with Chile, uh, we already have a, a free trade agreement with Chile. We have a free trade agreement with Peru. We have a trade agreement with Mexico. Those are already APEC countries, and we have a free trade agreement with Colombia. Mm. So we're, they're part of the uh, Latin America uh, Free Trade Association. 
Mm. And the United States is part of the inter-American uh, reciprocal uh, alliance. Uh, uh, these agreements made membership. recently, or are these agreements that were made before Trump? Uh, these were done way before Trump. I believe mm. it was done when. Uh, mm. well, Bush what about China? You know, a few weeks ago, uh, Trump said that he was going to uh, negotiate uh, or complete a negotiation of a, of a trade agreement with China. Uh, you know, giving us all some sort of hope um, that there would finally be an end uh, to the tariff war. Mm -hmm. And indeed, when he did that, he also uh, did not impose certain tariffs that he had threatened to impose. Mm -hmm. That was good news. But, but since that time, uh, A, there have, been, there have been little frictions, maybe bigger frictions, on various levels between China and the U.S., mm -hmm. some our friction uh, and threats and some their friction and threats. Um, and uh, there has been no news whatsoever mm -hmm, mm -hmm. about the status of these magical negotiations that are supposedly taking place with China, uh, which he said were leading to a, a wraparound and mm -hmm, amazing mm -hmm. agreement with China. Mm -hmm. um, but we haven't heard any more about it. Do you know about it? Can you tell us what the status of those discussions are and uh, what we can expect in the way of some wraparound mm -hmm. uh, agreement that will, mm -hmm. uh, you know, defang all this tariff uh, controversy? Oh, yeah, definitely, Jay. Uh, well, I think what happened was latest that was uh, China in terms of uh, based on, you know, they're afraid of retaliation tariff. They agreed on the $50 billion of buying agriculture goods from, uh, from pork, soya beans, so try to help out the, uh, the farmers in, in return of giving gov government subsidy. And, uh, so well, in terms of trade agreements, uh, they're trying to you know finalize that. But to me, what they need to do the most is the intellectual property rights. I think that's where the, all the worldwide uh, country, uh, looking at U.S.-China trade agreement because of our IT matter, paying for our uh, uh, intellectual property rights for uh, copyrights, infringement of uh, paying their fees. So all those things got to come in, and I think it's about China to realize that. But I think they're having a hard time internally with the internal policy between their private sector and state-owned enterprise, how they're going to adjust uh, intellectual property rights. Yeah, well, their economy is suffering, and I, they may be resistant about that because I think they rightly see that intellectual property is a big part of the future for them. And indeed, they're focusing a lot of capital and attention on, on uh, technology right now. Mm. So, um, you know, what about, but what about uh, the, the, the APEC as a, a kind of crucible for that discussion? You know, do you think that China and the U.S. Uh, will be meeting about their bilateral deal in Santiago, in the APEC, coming soon in a week or two? Oh, yeah, I think so. They are, what happens usually when the leaders get together, they meet on the sidelines, and they already have a, a meeting date schedule with their counterparts and uh, state officials there and uh, uh, see if we can uh, meet on the side. And uh, that's when they discuss mm -hmm. their matters. So I'm, I think it, uh, it's a smart thing to do uh, when they go there. And, uh, it's an opportunity, yeah. Exactly. What about other countries? I mean, is Trump trying to do uh, bilateral trade agreements with other countries that will be there as part of the, the uh, APEC 21? Um, do you think there are other agreements, bilateral agreements may come out of it? Yeah, I think a lot of them, I think that they focus it, it's going to be hosted in Latin America. I know this uh, APEC plays a role for having a voice of concern, and it treats all small countries and large, medium countries the same, so they get an equal vote, mm. equal consideration, mm. and a voice of concern. Mm. So I think in this time, when you know, not only in Chile, but I know they want to help their neighboring country. I know that there's a big turmoil in Venezuela this past early year with the uh, you know, government overthrow and you know, their past leader, Matergo, um, and basically so there's a big concern about bringing some of these uh, exodus of the Venezuelan that people went to Chile, kind of went to Peru, mm, went to other yeah, never there, country yeah. countries, so yeah. they're all concerned about those kind of issues. Yeah, sure. Well, at the same time, remember, this president is under impeachment. Um, this president uh, was uh, roundly criticized for what he did in, uh, in, in uh, Syria with the Kurds and all that recently. This president uh, has been making lots of gaffes and uh, statements that alienate millions and millions of people, not only in the U.S., but around the world. 
And I recall that uh, at one of the meetings in Europe, uh, he got up and made a really stupid speech. And they all laughed at him, literally, in the room, laughed at him. Uh, and I wonder what, you know, how people receive him among the, among the uh, APEC 21, mm -hmm. and how they will receive him in Santiago, and how, uh, you know, the South American countries who are involved, for example, uh, feel about him these days. Do you have a, any uh, idea about that? I think there's probably, they probably, probably have mixed feelings. I'm sure, you know, what's happening with Mexico, with the wall issue, with the borderline telling the Mexican leaders to mm -hmm. control their own little immigration mm -hmm. on the south of their border. So yeah. uh, those kind of issues, they might have still an impact. But this is more like in terms of uh, reassurance, what the APEC did in the past uh, conferences, and make sure there is an effort that uh, we're seeing progress being done. Well, it's, it seems it's a, a check-and-balance kind of gathering for the leaders as well. So. If you're talking about uh, bilateral agreements, if that's the, the order of the day, and, and we should discuss whether it really is the order of the day, but if you're talking about bilateral agreements as what is happening these days at APEC and otherwise, it seems to me that uh, there are 21 countries there. And of course, the U.S. is a big player, or has been a big player. I'm so sure it's as big a player as it used to be. Um, it's possible, if not probable, that the bilateral agreements that will be made at APEC in November, November 11th and so forth um, in Santiago will be bilateral agreements between other countries, not necessarily involving the U.S. If that's the order of the day, bilateral agreements, they can have their own bilateral agreements without us. What do you think? Can we expect that? Yeah, definitely. And that's what this whole uh, APEC process is about. You know, is we're not the only the players. Uh, we've got other uh, countries to work with. And we just got to show courtesy of professionalism as well and uh, see if we can have a dialogue and uh, see if we can keep our protocol with them uh, uh, intact. So mm -hmm. uh, that's what uh, uh, we have our representatives there already. And uh, we're working on it with the past uh, specialist that's uh, been working on the APEC issue with the uh, APEC Business Advisory Council that we sent three of our, uh, our top business leaders to be part of the uh, uh, APEC Business Advisory Council. One more question before the break. We'll take a break in a little, a little while. Uh, Russell, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the State Department, uh, even going back to R Rex Tillerson, you know, to the, the effect that the State Department has been, quote, hollowed out, end quote, that uh, important officials have not been reappointed, but they've left, uh, that uh, the State Department is um, not really in the inner circle of policy, foreign policy with Trump, uh, that he ignores them. Uh, and I think that's why a lot of them have left and are disaffected with this government. So what we have right now is, um, at the very least, a hollowed out State Department, a State Department where the, the halls are empty, so to speak, uh, and where the president and the State Department are not talking to each other, mm -hmm. not confiding in each other, not listening to each other. So how does that affect APEC? How does that affect our behavior at APEC and any other international meeting these days? I think, like I mentioned earlier, we have our uh, people that's been in, in APEC uh, representing us, uh, our officials, senior officials as well, with their staffing. And usually the staff stay on board with all the uh, transition of the APEC conferences. And with the Business Advisory Council that we have, and they've been working year round. They've been meeting occasionally, monthly basis or quarterly basis. So we have our business agenda already intact. So it's just a matter of uh, uh, you know, who the leader's gonna be, but they can still mingle. But when it comes to the end of the day, the working group's gonna be the ones that's gonna be uh, working on the policy. Yeah, well, I, well, and I remember the uh, APEC <laughs> conference in, here in 2012, was it? Um, that the, the, the most of the people who were here were not government at all. They were business. And uh, I suppose what, what I hear you saying is that in, in Chile, in Santiago, the, the real work is done by the people from the business community, maybe the multinationals, the American corporations want to do over, you know, work overseas, get into contracts with overseas uh, entities. Those are the ones we're going to be going in force. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones who are going to be trying to make deals more than our government, more than our State Department, 
more than our president. Am I right about that? Yeah, it's, it's actually, they already have stake there. They, you know, they've been invested so much in overseas with factories and financial services. Like, for mm -hmm. example, in Chile, the United States has roughly about $40 billion of assets of our real estate as well, businesses, stocks and bond, and all that invested in Chile already. And roughly, we actually uh, export roughly about $11 billion of, uh, or, uh, or $14 billion of goods to uh, Chile yearly. And we import $11 billion of goods. That could be agricultural goods, flour, produce uh, that we consume here. You look at, you go to Costco, a lot of them, all the fruits and flowers are from Chile. And our blueberries or, you know. Uh, fruits and plums and you know mm -hmm. all those stuff. So you know their agriculture. And what I'm trying to do is, they're pretty advanced in agriculture technology with the STEM field. So I want to mm -hmm. see if uh, Hawaii can uh, uh, learn, from, learn them. from them as well, work in some kind of technology transfer because we want to uh, diversify our agriculture here as well. So in terms of so domestic, so Hawaii demand. should go down there and participate uh, in the uh, in actually in we the should APEC have a concern of So that's why I prepared these uh, strategic business. So who's plan. going? Actually, from our side, uh, uh, from the business point, the APEC National Center, which I work closely or I, you know, I communicate with my correspondents, uh, and they're part of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So they're the blue chip corporations that How we have. How about the Hawaii Chamber of Commerce? Uh, they're kind of uh, secondary in certain ways, but I know there's, you know, we kind of piggyback with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So with, uh, and I've been trying to dialogue with the uh, uh, APEC National Center so mm -hmm. we can show them what, what we have to offer from Hawaii's businesses. Okay. And, that, and that uh, would be bi bilateral, that mm -hmm. is uh, U.S. business and Hawaii business with, uh, with Chile and Chile business. Okay, we're gonna take a short break. That's oh. Russell Hanra. He's, uh, he, clo he follows closely uh, APEC, uh, not only in the day when it happened here, but every, day, every year since, and this year in, uh, Santiago, Chile, November 11th. Uh, so we'll be coming, coming back shortly. And we'll be talking about some of the, some of the other implications about the um, sort of the dynamic, the, uh, the kaleidoscopic dynamic of international trade relations with Russell Hama. We'll be right back. Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Mon Lee and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Duane Carisu, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group Limited, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Trade agreements, uh, mostly bilateral these days, but also multilateral, and uh, and how uh, they will all be affected by the APEC meeting coming in two weeks in Santiago, Chile. But one of the one of the things that uh, we were talking about, Russell, I think is very important is to is to take a look at One Belt One Road because that's uh, essentially a trade agreement and a development agreement by China or initiative by China. We go as far west as Spain. They want to go all the way to Spain. They're already in Africa. They're all, you know, they're everywhere. And it's more, it's more than one road. It's a, it's a southern uh, route and a northern route and a sea route. Um, it's, and it's not, just, uh, one, it's not just one continent. It's the whole world. Um, they, they are trying to expand their trade connections all over the world with one belt, one road. Uh, and they're making some headway, although they have problems with uh, what they call the debt traps where countries get to hate them because they sell these uh, expensive harbors and infrastructure, and then the country can't pay the bill, and then the Chinese take over and everybody hates them for it. That's happened in a number of places. I don't know how they're dealing with that. But the problem, the problem is, where's Europe? 
Europe has, uh, and for that matter, where's APEC? What is APEC doing about One Belt, One Road? Is it being left out or included? What's Europe, which is not included, as you said, in APEC? What is Europe, Europe doing about One Belt, One Road? Are there competitive uh, One Belt, One Road type initiatives, or is it just the Chinese? Well, I can tell you, Jay, good, good thing you asked me that question. And uh, well, that was one of my closing remarks on my strategic business plan that I prepared at uh, unifying in the European Union an APEC organization together. That way they can work on the Euro-Asia uh, infrastructure development, moving goods and services. Uh, and if you look at the history, Silk Road, I know that China was taking the initiative since the Han's dynasty, going from 2nd century to 18th century. Silk Road played a major road, going from Beijing, Shanghai, all the way to Spain, going through Afghanistan, Pakistan, the route through uh, Turkey to Syria, Iran. And if you go to the south, they go through Egypt to Africa, eventually go so You had a lot of trade, and what happened was uh, the Europeans were trading a lot of fur, beef, uh, fur animals, and gold. In return, China was given the uh, silk and tea. The 15th century. Yeah, right. So they played a big role. But the 15th century, that's when uh, 14 and 15 was a dangerous role for Silk Road. Because Mongolia, with uh, the Mongolians are uh, taking power, uh, they were kind of ruling that whole area. So it wasn't safe to travel the Silk Road back then uh, with Genghis Khan in power. But, but with what happened with the trade routes, there's north, south, and south, west. There's three routes that China was pushing for that back then. But now with year 2013 came with the modern Silk Road concept where Xi Jinping became the president, and he decided we have to re uh, readjust the Silk Road concept with modernized China for their benefit. So they started the infrastructure investment bank uh, with the BRICS, with the uh, Brazil, Africa, Russia, China, uh, and India was part of it, and they established that infrastructure and uh, development bank in order to uh, get everybody involved and built the infrastructure to do the Euro-Asia concept, and that was very clever. But now, you know, what happened, like you said, Jay, earlier, because all these loans that China was giving with, with economic uh, uh, prosperity they had, and some of them became bad loans, and the, what happened was these countries couldn't pay back uh, their loans, so the China got control of the infrastructure. There's a provision in their clause on the loan saying that if you cannot pay back your loan based on your monitoring fiscal policy, uh, we're going to have control of your ports, airports, well, highways. That's pretty serious. Yeah, where so they kind of blood money. The country monies. owns your ports. Exactly. That's happening in Africa, happening in Sri Lanka, and Malaysia is kind of looking at that too. So, uh, what happened with uh, 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 the APEC organizations, very concerned about with ASEAN development. So, what happened was Japan, and this happened like two or three weeks ago. The European Union was very interested in coming into Asia again because of the 1920s. Uh, they're here already with the British, the Germans, and they're colonizing a lot of with the Dutch here, colonizing Southeast Asia. So after the World War II and the post-war, they, they pulled out. Left, yeah. And now they're showing interest, and uh, they want to come in and be part of APEC. And they made an agreement with Japan with uh, Prime Minister Abe Shinzo about What's three weeks ago. the nature of the agreement? And the nature said they want to compete with China on the One Belt, One Road initiative, infrastructure development. So. In other words, Japan and European Union is going to be a partner, and Asia's got their infrastructure development with the BRICS partner. So they are going to be fighting for infrastructure projects. But, but to me, you know, in terms of competition, it might bring the cost down. But uh, you, know, you, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. So maybe in terms of infrastructure for China, border, border control, they can do that internally, and meeting the airports, highways, and uh, railroads to uh, integrate in terms of intermodal and make it more efficient. And other countries can do the same and come up their own project scope of their infrastructure and kind of share that with their partners. And that way you get, you get a better uh, feasible project. Well, a little competition. And maybe you get a kinder, kinder gentler approach, uh, you know, from the European countries and, um, and businesses than um, the, this kind of uh, predatory Lending that China has been doing. 
Um, so how far have they gotten with this new idea? It's a very new and interesting idea. How far have they gotten? Actually, you know, it just came out, so I'm sure they're looking at the mapping and, you know, see which route is the best, which feasible routes, and uh, in terms of ports, airports, and uh, railroads, and highways. Mm. And they want to make sure that uh, they're going to find the most efficient way, cost-saving, to get uh, the partners in. You know, it's, it's going to be project. very interesting, Russell, and you and I will have to take a look at it going forward. Is if the European uh, and APEC groups try to do a one belt, one road uh, in the same areas as China is trying to do a one belt, one road. And those areas include, uh, for example, ports that are controlled or owned by the Chinese. What happens to the Europeans when they try to get into that port? I mean, it could be we have some really aggressive competition going on I there. I think that's where the tariffs or the trade's going to, because you're going to get warf warfare's charge, uh, the cost of the fees of uh, exactly. breaking bulk. You know, is there going to be customs or regulations on? Is it Was there a free trade agreement with them? Exactly. So it's going to get to be border very control, complicated. Right, yeah. so that's why, uh, you know, I made that dialogue. Maybe the European Union and the APEC organization can unify together and come up with a free trade agreement. That's like putting all the eggs in one basket. And that kind of resolves a lot of the headaches of yeah. the border control. Russell, you are uh, definitely a, a make peace kind of guy, make trade kind of guy. Wish you well in your efforts in that regard. And I think we should get back together again and see how these things play yeah. out sometime after APEC and after the European initiative is, mm -hmm. is rolled out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for closing, uh, you know, I think you know, Hawaii can play a major role because we are, are the hub of Asia Pacific, and we are the gateway of Asia. So I'd like to see more American uh, companies involved, uh, construction industry yeah. as well, through the infrastructure, engineering firms, uh, developers. Uh, so we can uh, do a partnership kind of joint venture. With yeah, them. hold that and, thought, hold that thought. Another thing is, we are <laughs> the gateway to Asia. Never forget that. We have to play on that. And other thing is, other thing is that uh, hopefully there's a lot of negotiating. We're competing for the G7 summit meeting next year in Hawaii. And as you know, the G7 has a lot of European leaders from Germany, France, Italy, and we have a European Union Council president on board as well. So I think yeah. that might play a major role for Hawaii yeah. hosting the G7 summit here in July of uh, 2020. Yeah, Maybe they could do it at the Trump Hotel in Waikiki. I'm only kidding. Russell Hanna, <laughs> thank you for coming down. Yeah, thank Russell. you, Jay. Aloha.